Night America is an independently produced podcast. If you like what we're doing, please consider supporting patreon.com slash nightmarica. Welcome to Nightmarica, a podcast that takes you on a tour of the abnormal, paranormal, weirdly true, and truly weird in every corner across this nation. Because whether it's ghosts, aliens, monsters, or monstrous humans, there's something strange in your neighborhood. Episode 37, Spirits and Spirits of the Vineyard. Ooh, I like that spirits and spirits. Is it spirits? No, spirits. Like a spirit? Like a ghost is a spirit? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. A spirit? <laughs> I wish this was a video medium so the audience could see the face you're giving me right now. Like, like Britt, we're episode 36 in and you didn't know how to pronounce spirits. And this is episode 37. So. <laughs> 30, so, spirit. Spirit and spirit. You know, like spirit is booze. And a like the gin and is, tonic I'm drinking. Yes, which is funny because normally you malign me for people hearing your clinky ice glass. I know, but, but it is my day off tomorrow after working Black Friday weekend and Cyber Monday, so I'm right. ready to enjoy. Well, cheers to that. And yeah, no, boo, it's like booze and booze. I mean, except that's spelled differently, yeah. but spirits and spirit. Anyhow, we're talking about vineyards and wineries and stuff. And I was gonna go with a grapes of wrath or ghosts of wrath. I just couldn't come up with it at the on you know at crunch time. It wasn't I didn't put a lot or of thought. Crush into time. It. Yes, or crush like you time. Like crush grapes. Do you remember Grape Lady on YouTube? No. Oh my god, it was a gem. It was like a woman crushing grapes on the news, and then she loses her balance and falls, and like keeps moaning on live television, and then it comes oh, yeah. back to the anchors, and they're like, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, I did see that. Yeah, I know that. Well, yeah, well, here we are. We're doing, we're talking about vineyards and stuff. There's a lot of material to talk about when it comes to breweries and mm -hmm. vineyards. This is going to be one that we're going to have to come back to, I think. Definitely. But but we can, we can crush it today <laughs> by starting with, uh, with, with vineyard things and... Speaking of crushing it, you know who's crushing it? Manscaped. This, this, crushing this it. Is, they are crushing it. Manscaped, the right tools for the job. We are still happy to be in the sponsorship family with them. And mm -hmm. not only that, but I'm sure you got this in the mail. Did you get a nose trimmer, nose hair trimmer? Uh, I got crop cleanser. Oh, Okay. I got a I nose may have hair the nose trimmer. hair trimmer crop coming, but I yes. got Devin some crop cleanser. Well, I'll tell you what, nose hair trimmer, it's men, women, anyone can stand to trim their nose hair. For sure. And look, we are already a big fan of the Lawnmower 3.0 for taking care of your down nether regions. Yep. Doesn't nick that. your nugs, right, Aaron? Right, doesn't nick your nugs. You want to tame that. You want to tame the holly and the ivy down there. Oh my you know, god, that was so well said. Because we're in Christmas season, you know, and so. But with the nose hair trimmer, I have to say, as a man now in my forties, you really got to be on top of your air, ear hair and nose hair. It is it is one of the more insulting parts about getting older is having to deal with that. But with the manscaped. Uh, nose, I forget the name of it actually, but it, weed whacker. Call it weed whacker. Yeah. Yeah. Which is appropriate. You're whacking the weeds on your, on your nose and yep. I think it's great. So you'll hear more about Manscaped throughout this show, but remember just at the top of the show, if you want to pause now, go to manscaped.com, enter the code nightmarica, you get 20% off and free shipping on your orders. So that's pretty great. So, yeah. It's an awesome gift. Ladies. It is an awesome yeah. gift to give. Yeah, it is. It is. It's an awesome gift to get. So I'm, I might buy some more for myself and, and treat myself. But 
Hey, before we get into the topic, let's hear about some news of the weird and paranormal news from out there. What, what do you got? Lay it on me, Britt. Well, I'm a little bit nervous that you might have the same news as me. Um, but I got from an article from Wine Spectator magazine, one of my dad's favorites, um, Michael Robert, who owns the Couteau Rougemont Winery in Quebec, um, was like letting his workers in to pick a bunch of grapes. And when they got there, they realized that the like netting over the grapes had been removed and there was a ton of empty black garbage bags everywhere and half of a ton of grapes had vanished this was recently. What? This was November 13th. Someone stole, they said, the equivalent up to 25 cases of wine. They, like, snuck in in the middle of the night. It was, like, kind of hidden from the road. And they think quite a few people stole. And it would have totaled $7,000 of finished wine. That's a, lo- that's a lot of vino. That's a lot of vino. Like, that stinks. Don't be a thief. The great grape caper yeah but who knew that like stealing just grapes was like a thing i don't know i guess the you know i blame grimace from mcdonald's the big he's like a grape looking guy oh i know my sister had like quite an attack on like from him my sister has a permanent dent in her shin from grimace oh that is well that's see that means that he's got a prior. He's got he prior. Does. He's got priors. Uh, Grimace has priors. Maybe he teamed up with the Hamburglar and they decided, you know, maybe as they get older, they're like, you know, burgers are maybe not so great for our coronary health, but you know what it is? What is great for us is some wine. So yep. let's team up. You're purple. I'm a burglar. And let's hit, <laughs> let's hit a, uh, is that That's your a bur- Hamburglar? Yeah. That was pretty good. <laughs> I don't really know what he sounds like, but we'll just assume that he sounds like that. Somewhere in between uh, Gollum and, I don't know. What staters, precious? See, you are, you're busting out all the voices and we're Listen, already... That's my favorite line. Yeah. Well, that's that's odd. That definitely fits within the odd realm. My, my news story is not the same as yours, okay. so you're in luck there. Now, instead... There is, this comes to us from Fox 30 slash CBS 47 News in Jacksonville, Florida. And, hey, the Florida theater, the Florida theater in Jacksonville is pleased to announce that the theater's famous ghost seat has returned. Mm. Yeah. The theater has been in the process of refurbishing its seating, but they knew. Even though they were refurbishing their seating, they knew they had to keep two seats around, and those were the ghost seats. Now, these seats were supposedly were discovered when the show Local Haunts, which is, I guess, a local paranormal show, paranormal investigative show, discovered these seats and captured images of what looks like a ghostly apparition of a man sitting in the, in the balcony. Now, this mm. then attracted the interest of the sci-fi channel show Factor Faked. It's a couple years ago. And they conducted their own paranormal investigation. Now, Factor Faked, great people on that show. Uh, I know a couple of those guys. Bill Murphy, Ben Hansen, uh, Giles Pardo, a couple great people on that show. Anyhow, mm. Factor Faked decided that, well, okay, maybe it was not a legit paranormal footage, but... You know what? Mm. That doesn't matter because the theater has decided that even though they are refurbishing the theater, they decided to keep these famous ghost seats and they are restoring these seats instead of refurbishing them. Every other seat in this place is being replaced. So these ghost seats remain. And they said, and this is kind of sweet, the president of the Florida theater said, we did not want our ghost to be homeless if his or her sweet seat went away permanently. Aww. So, you I know, like that's, that. it's pretty sweet. And yeah. it's a nice way, nice little nod to the history of a location. So that's, you know, ghost, ghost seats. Keep your ghost seat. So I like that. Yeah. But uh, I, having been, having grown up in 
well, spent a lot of time in France. I imagine you mm-hmm. visited a fair amount of wineries, oh, right? Oh, I've been to quite a lot of wineries, so I was very excited when you picked this topic so I could share a lovely personal anecdote of my life. I like the way you sounded so excited. Like, you didn't sound excited. At, you sounded like someone that really spends a lot of time at wineries. <laughs> like, I did. And the first time I ever got drunk was in a winery. I was, I believe, 14 years old. And we were visiting our family. We, so I grew up in a, like, quote unquote suburb of Paris called Neuilly sur Seine, but it's like super close to the Arc de Triomphe, if anyone knows Paris. Um, we have a listener from Berlin, so hey, Vialeri, she probably knows. Um, but everybody knows the Arc de Triumph. I know, but like, I just wanted to give a shout out to our Berlin listener. She's like super hi. active on social, so whatever. Um, well, hi. Hi. We so we're super close to Arc de Triumph, and around the corner from our apartment was this incredible locally owned wine shop. And my parents became really good friends with the owner. My mom had like her 40th birthday there. Like they were really close to us. So the owner invited us to his family's vineyard winery in the South of France. So we went and I was 14 years old. I sat next to his very elderly mother Um, and in France, old people speak French a little bit slower, so I could understand her very well since I was still kind of learning the language. And so she and I just hung out, talked all day. She was pouring me glass after glass of wine. I got very drunk with this old woman. And when my parents came back, like they had been out walking the winery, they were like, oh my God, our daughter's only 14. And the woman was like, oh, I thought she was 18. Did she say, sacre bleu? Yes, I'm sure she did. (laughs) Um, So I have such fond memories of wineries. And we would go all the time and, like, do tours of them. So I have good memories of my parents drinking and spitting growing up. You spit the wine out. You don't swallow it. Yeah, I, I been to I've been to wineries, (laughs) but I don't spit the wine out. I drink, I swallow the wine. I feel like if I'm going to be... Tasting good wine, I'm gonna drink it. It's going into my body. Mm. Oh yeah, it's for not, sure, me too. I'm not getting rid of it. And Heck no. I've been to. I mean, I didn't. I didn't go to a lot of vineyards until I was older, but I do love it. I I really enjoy wine, and I know a little bit about wine. But I will say that wine is not my go-to drink most times because it will mess me up. And I really like it though. It's just not typically the thing that I order casually but yeah. i do like wine and hey all you nightmarecans out there we would say drink responsibly enjoy yeah. your wine but enjoy it responsibly so yeah well yeah, let's dive in let's let's get into our winery stories and i'm gonna let you begin Britt. what what's what's your story cool well i'm doing kind of a crazy story based in napa wine money and murder in Napa. Um, So it starts with Dominic Fapoli, who is a fourth generation winemaker in Napa. Um, He knows how hard it is to make a business come off the ground. They say, and this is my dad's favorite joke. Do you know how to become a millionaire? Aaron? Um, How do you become a millionaire, Britt? You be a billionaire and then you open a winery. Ha ha ha! Classic. <laughs> love it. That's one of my. I wish I could love it as much as your dad loves that joke. That's my dad's favorite joke, and this story really proves that to be true. Uh, so Dominic Fapoli, like I said, a fourth generation winemaker. This is like his family's business. This is what he's grown up, you know, knowing the trade. And in 2011, a man by the name of Robert Dahl decided to move from Minnesota, where he had a company selling mold remover, and moved to Napa Valley. All his friends called him, like, fun and outgoing, super sociable, so he made a good business partner because he got sales, and he got relationships and building sales from that. He started at the real bottom of the wine business, which is where you buy and sell grapes, just like plain grapes that they put into bottles called shiners. And this is where companies buy just blank bottles so they can put their own label on it. 
So I took, I don't know if it's true, but I took it as like when celebrities have their own wine. Like I doubt some of these celebrities were going into picking their own grapes and they just buy these shiners to put the labels on. So that's where he started it. And even though the wine was terrible, like all the articles I read said the wine was awful wine. He sold it nonstop. Like he could not keep it in stock. And so since he was such a good salesperson, he partnered with Dominic Vapoli and they decided to go into business together, buying a vineyard together. And they put all of their money into it for Dominic. Like this is a big investment. This is his dream job. And so like this was huge to him for Robert having been pretty rich already, like you know, it wasn't as much of a big deal to him. Now, meanwhile, at the same time in Hollywood, there is a man named Ahmad Tafalis who made it super big in Silicon Valley. And then with all of his money that he was getting from there, decided to start investing in movies and supporting um, smaller producers and actors who wanted to kind of build their business. So he was a really good guy. He was supporting some of these smaller industries and investing in them. He was even getting money from these kind of, you know, smaller projects and decided to buy a country home in Napa. And I would love to have a country home in Napa. Any, honestly, anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. I would love to not sleep on a pull-out couch. Um, So the idea of a country home sounds great. And why'd you just give me that look? I'm paying attention. I'm an engaged listener. In 2013, Ahmad got a really big cash investment from one of his Silicon Valley productions. And he decided to now back Robert into buying his own vineyard, giving him a total of $1.2 million dollars. That is a lot of money. That's, well, yeah, I guess unless you're a billionaire or... I guess. But that was a lot. Um, And at the very start, the vineyard is really growing. And so Imad invests an extra 800000 to keep building the business and expanding. And so now he's $2 million in. And so Robert's a busybody. He now has this vineyard with Dominic. He has his own business, his own winery. And now he decides to partner with one more group. He partners with a couple named Francine and Greg Niddle. And they decide to go in and make a brewery together. Um, And the brewery, like within a few months, becomes really profitable. And so they then decide to expand and have a restaurant attached to it. So okay. he's like got businesses booming right now. Things this are going all, well. They're going well. 2011, 2012. But now it is 2014. And Dominic Fapoli answers the phone and someone is talking about foreclosure procedures starting. And Dominic's like, what are you talking about? Like we we're paying our bills, you know, we're doing okay. Everything's fine. So he calls Robert and was like, what is this call all about? I don't understand. You're in charge of the books. It seems like everything's fine. And Robert like blows him off. Like, don't worry. Maybe it's a scam, you know, whatever. But Dominic starts digging more into the books and realizing things aren't adding up quite right. So he decides to pay off Robert and just be done with him. Like this is his dream. He did not want his reputation tarnished in this industry. So he just pays him, buys the business off of him, and is totally done. Um, Interestingly, at the same time, Robert's friend, who's an electrician, who did work on the vineyard, also his name is Miles Davis. I just thought that was an interesting addition. Probably not the Miles Davis. Miles Davis, probably not the blues musician. No, but it's just fun. Or jazz musician. Yeah, it's just fun when, you know, you got a celeb name. It's, it would be even more fun if Miles Davis, the, like the famous Miles Davis, a, a jazz trumpeter, faked his own death. Did you just Google to see what instrument he played? No. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> but I was looking when he died because I remember, I, I vaguely remember when he died. But it would be funny if 
Miles Davis faked his own death and then came back as an electrician, <laughs> but didn't bother to change his name. So then he was Miles Davis, the electrician. He'd be like, are you sure you're not Miles Davis, the jazz trumpeter? And he'd be like, no, no, that's silly. I'm, why would I fake my own death but keep my name as Miles Davis, the electrician? Anyhow, this was going nowhere. This tangent is boring me. Continue. No, I liked it. I liked it. Um, well, this was a friend of Robert's in the area, and he was owed $15,000 by Robert but wasn't paid. But they were good friends, so he felt awkward asking for any money. But as Dominic's realizing what's going on, Miles then tells him what's happening with him. So next, the brewery has now been open for over six months. And Greg, this is Robert's business partner in the brewery, walks in and notices, I was about to say beer bottles, but they were kegs, noticing kegs being delivered. And he's like, why are we getting kegs, full kegs delivered? This is a brewery. We're making our own beer. What's up? So Greg calls Robert and again confronts him. And Robert's like, well, you know, making our own beer wasn't that profitable. So I've started buying it. But, you know, now we're losing money. So I think we're just going to need to foreclose. Greg is livid. Him and Francine invested $250,000 of their own money as well as their friend's money they encouraged to invest. And so they are not accepting this answer. And now finally, at the same time, Imad notices that the extra $800,000 he'd personally invested in this winery was actually never spent on the winery and was instead paying for Robert's lavish life. So Imad hires a PI named Dawn King, who's a former FBI agent. You know how I feel about female like FBI agents. I just think they're so cool. Um, she finds out doing some digging that Robert had been charged for theft multiple times in Minnesota, where he used to live, including theft by swindle. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. He went to jail twice in 1989 and 1991, both times pleading guilty. So he is a convicted felon. Um... He also had, like, a very sketchy mentality because Lou Perdue is a wine... Why can I not talk today? Lou Perdue is a wine reporter in Napa, and in one of his articles, he starts writing about all of this that's happening to Robert because Napa's a small community. Like, word travels fast, and he was, you know, writing about it. And Robert then goes in and posts thousands of comments and red bold letters defending himself but they showed a picture and it was like pages and pages and pages of like him essentially trolling him um i just thought that was interesting anyway yeah and totally um, what somebody that has nothing to hide would do exactly um Imad starts to fight Robert by filing a lawsuit requiring Robert to stop selling inventory. And this means not only wine, but grapes in the machinery itself. Uh, but whilst not that he is, Robert went and started secretly selling the equipment on the side to get some sort of money coming in because he no longer had income. Uh, Robert reaches out to Imad saying, okay, you know, let's meet at the vineyard and have a talk. They get there. They have their attorneys on speakerphone. And while they're all kind of finalizing stuff, Robert then goes back on the deal, arguing for thousands and thousands of dollars or less than what was agreed upon. So the lawyers are like, you know what? Give us a call back when you have some sort of decision made. We're hanging up. Talk amongst yourselves and give us a call back. 20 minutes later, the lawyers didn't hear anything back, which they thought was super odd. Um, and then one of them gets a notification that there was a shooting on the property. Ahmad and Robert, it turns out, were talking, being civil, civil, and then suddenly Robert shot Ahmad with a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun. Terrified, Ahmad takes off running down the row of grapes, like this beautiful scenic vineyard you see in movies, you see in beautiful pictures, and it's turned into like such a crime scene. Imad's sprinting down on foot, 
Robert was a little heavier, realizes he couldn't catch him on foot, so he goes back, gets in his car, and decides to cut Imad off, like, at the end of one of the rows. And while he's running, Imad is able to call the police and is like, hey, I've just been shot at. I'm trying to escape. As he's running to the end, the police pull up. And right as they pull to the scene, they park, they open the door to get out of their ca- cars. Cars. I guess I've been spending Cass. time in New Jersey. Um, Robert gets out as well and shoots Imad straight in the head. And the police are there to witness all of it. Like, how scary for Ahmad. Like, he had to think, here's the police, I'm home safe, and that's when he gets shot. That's terrible. I'm guessing he doesn't survive this? No, he's dead. He was shot, like, square in the head. Um, But something to point out, in my opinion, is that he asked to meet at the winery... He had somehow acquired a gun, which as a convicted felon, he could not have gone into the store and acquired it legally. Um, He had 750 rounds of ammo and a magnetic gun holder, which you can use to hide a gun under a car, um, and duct tape and flex handcuffs all in his car. So this was heavily premeditated. This was not like an argument gone wrong. He's reacting like he had this planned out. And I'm guessing none of that ammo were Sauvignon blanks. Oh, that was yeah. well played. Yeah. Uh, that was good. Not really, but I'll take it. Um, Don King, the PI and former FBI agent who I love, um, says he got away with it because just no one checked in on him. Like one simple Google search would have shown his whole history in Minnesota. But he was such like a smooth talker and was like, you know, such a salesman. People just believed him. So do your research, guys. Um, But to end on a happy note, Dominic Fapoli did not ruin his career. Um, He is now happily the owner of Christopher Creek Winery. Um, And then the winery that all of this took place in is now owned by the Hill family, And if you Google it, it looks like the facilities and tasting room are super gorgeous. So I cannot wait to go and it's some, if we're ever allowed to travel again, go and do some tastings at this winery. I will say it didn't end happily for everyone. Like the guy got murdered. Yeah. Amada did not end happily for him. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. So we've got a, Vintage murder. Murder is the vintage. No. Vintage murder. I mean, Uh, it's not that vintage. It was like 2014. Well, I was just trying to work in another (laughs) wine pun there. (laughs) Should have prepared my wine jokes better. That's all right. Uh, You've had a lot on your plate lately. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just whining about it now. So, would I like a little cheese with that wine? Always. Give me a nice charcuterie board. Uh, well, let's, before we dive into this next story, let's hear from our sponsors. Nightmerica is excited to announce we have a new sponsor, Manscaped. And to talk about the men's grooming kit, we have a really big fan of Manscaped. But not a man, a Sasquatch. From the Florida Everglades, let's welcome Skunk Ape to the show. Thanks for joining, Mr. Ape. Oh, Skunk is fine, just fine. That's uh, that's what my friends call me. Even though you're an elusive cryptid, you're able to have a social life? Oh, sure, sure. Wood booger, yeah, we mow, mow, wendigo, mow galong. We all, we all hang out. Well, that's great. With all those friends, it's probably important to look your best. We take a lot of pride in how we look uh, in the Sasquatch community, especially a uh, since, uh, as you can imagine, there ain't a whole heck of a lot of us out there, so it gets pretty darn competitive getting attention from the lady squatches. So the Lawnmower 3.0 from Manscaped has a durable, skin-safe ceramic blade when you groom your, uh, squatchy regions. Don't you know it? That Lawnmower 3.0 holds an edge, so I'm less likely to nick my nugs. It's happened before, and it ain't pretty. There's blood everywhere. Everyone down in the glades heard me howl out that one time. Whoop whoop! That's what 
That's what it sounded like when I nicked my nugs. But not with this lawnmower 3.0. Dude, that's intense. I have certainly been there. It is no fun at all. Skunky, I imagine grooming down there probably takes a lot of time because you're a pretty big guy. Well, you know what they say about big feet. Big shoes? Big balls! Yep, right, sizable. Sasquatchicles. Big old ones. But with them lithium-ion batteries I can charge that puppy up on the USB dock, I can use it for 90 minutes. It's even waterproof, so I can fire it up in the glades and take a good long time getting my squashicles right where they needs to be. Well, with that waterproof technology, that's got to be helpful in the glades. Or even for a human like me who uses the shower. Is the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 getting you noticed down there? Only in the right ways. All the lady squatches or, or men, no, no judgment, they take notice. But I can still stay hidden because with that quiet stroke technology, it does not make a lot of noise and attract unwanted look and lose And that's a very important part of the Squatch code. You gotta stay undercover, you know. I can even groom up my Squatchicles in the middle of the night. Because it's got an LED light on it. So you can see where your Patterson and Gimlin are. It's a memorable pair. And speaking of memorable pairs, you also like the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Well, you might have heard I have a bit of an odor issue, hence the nickname Skunky. And with the Florida humidity, uh, I can smell pretty darn ripe down there. So I use that Manscaped ball deodorant to, to make the squashicles smell fresh as a daisy and the ball toner to freshen up when skunk turns to funk. Maybe we should start calling you Flowers instead of Skunky. Well, Skunky... If you or your Squatch Buddies or any listeners out there want to groom safely, and who doesn't, head over to manscaped.com and enter code NIGHTMERICA for 20% off plus free shipping off your order. For one more time, that's... Squatchscaped. No, no it's not. It's Manscaped. Manscaped. The right tools for the job. So, my story is set at a place that has a French name, and I'm going to pronounce it Belvoir. B-E-L-V-O-I-R. How would you say that? Belvoir. B-E-L-V-O-I-R. Belvoir. Le Belvoir. Yeah, but isn't that French? How would you say it? Belvoir. Belvoir. That's how you would say it? Yeah. I'm, so not Belvoir? No, I don't think so. Not if there's an E at the end. No, there's not an E. Oh, there's not an E. Belvoir. Just an R. Then yeah, I don't think you pronounce the R. Belvoir. Belvoir. That sounds very fancy when I say it like that. Belvoir. Ooh, this well, is look, beautiful. I don't care about the pronunci I do care about the pronunciation quite a bit. But I also care <laughs> I about don't care. Sounding- I'm a not American. Yeah. I I do care about sounding cool and fancy, so I'm gonna say Belvoir. Anyhow, the Belvoir winery is Located in Missouri, or Missouri. If you hey, prefer. Missouri's not in the South. No, you it's not. That? I do. Oh, yeah, that's right. I from recall the Sydney that. Loop. Yeah, and so the background is so the Odd Fellows. First off, let me just talk about Odd Fellows. It's an international fraternity. I, I also just like saying Odd Fellows, but it's an international fraternity. It goes back to 1730 at the at the earliest, or at the at least back until 1730 in London. And the it's not really. It has some perhaps religious overtures, but it's largely a secular group, and it promotes as a fraternal organization philanthropy and charity. So it's not really a it, it's it's a good group and the American based inter independent order of odd fellows enrolls six hundred thousand members across ten thousand lodges in thirty countries. So and that one's that one's American based. So with that said, the Belvoir Winery is located in the old Odd Fellows location and the independent order of odd fellows was founded in 1819 by thomas wild wildy in baltimore maryland and the buildings on which the belvoir winery occupies 
is a 240 acre farm and that was established in 1900. Now, this collection of buildings is architecturally significant. It's, it is a collection of Jaco Jacobethan, Jacobethan revival buildings. A hard word. It is a hard word. And the three that remain are the administrative building, the old folks building, and the old hospital. Those were all designed by different architects over a period of 23 years. Yes, the old folks building. Is that what you're giggling at? <laughs> I am giggling at that. <laughs> Oh, it I just figured. feels I, mean to like separate them from everybody else. Yeah, well, it was it was basically uh, yeah an old folks home, but it was sort of like a senior citizens housing. But back when you would call it different things. I mean, yeah. as far as some of the really insensitive terminology for people back in the day, this is old folks is maybe not the worst considering That's what it's very it, true. You bring up a good argument. Yeah. So the odd fellow's home was. It's pretty significant because in the early 20th century, it was an example of statewide home providing care and education for orphans and elderly members mm -hmm. of the fraternal organization. And there was only one other in the state of Missouri at the time that it was built, and that was a Masonic home in St. Louis. And really, this was established to take care of its members, take care of win widows, take care of orphans, and... Even like the Missouri Oddfellows in Liberty, Missouri, was viewed as a form of health and life insurance. As long as these members of the Oddfellows were in good standing, they could count on the Oddfellows to take care of them or their family if misfortune should arrive. It's also the International Order of Oddfellows. It's the largest fraternal and benevolent order in the United States. And while it is does have the the aim of providing assistance and comfort. It is also something of a secret society. It has its own system of rights and lodges, not unlike the Masons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a pretty cool organization and a pretty cool location because there, like I said, there is the old folks home building and that's located in the center of this property. And even on the, the signs on the door will say which individual lodge the benefactor of the room was and uh, who was inside, who the inhabitant was. Mm -hmm. And this home was also supported by produce that was raised on this located on this farm, the surrounding farm. And then there was the old hospital building, and this was established in 1905, and... This was a building that, well, it served as a, as a hospital, but it was not only, it was at one time the only medical facility in Liberty, Missouri. It even had its own laboratory, which was pretty cool. And in 1955, the nursing home was built, and the Grand Lodge of the Oddfellows at the time voted at that time to permit the admittance of paying non-members into the hospital. There was also the old school, and it was said that the Oddfellows actually provided really good basic education for children and orphans, and it encouraged development in other areas. In 1908, I found this kind of interesting, there was the first instrumental cl music classes that were offered, and eventually a boys band was even organized, and they made annual tours of the state of Missouri. And there was high school attendance, which was not necessarily an option for some children at the turn of the century, but it was pretty, pretty matter of course at the, at the Oddfellows home. And there was even college, edu college tuition provided as early as the 1920s. So it's pretty wow, well. Like, it's it does a lot of pretty good. Great. Yeah. yeah. By 1951, there were no longer any children at the home, and this building this building actually was demolished. There's also a cemetery on the property, and again, as part of their desire to give aid and assistance, the Grand Lodge of the Odd Fellows would even help by providing a cemetery, a plot, and burial service on 
uh, to members of the Odd Fellows, and then elderly residents and things like that. And the cemetery contains the remains of nearly 600 people, and outside the cemetery gate is a memorial de- dedicated by the International Order of Odd Fellows to members who were killed in World War Two. Mm-hmm. So, okay, only three of the historic buildings remain on this sprawl of pretty, the, the buildings that are on there are pretty elegant. And we have, those three are the administrative building, the old folks home, and the hospital. Okay, now it is currently home to the Belvoir Winery. Now, the lime coolers, and I don't believe I'm mispronouncing mispronouncing their name, but the lime coolers of the family that bought this winery in 1993, and they bought it from the Oddfellows, or bought this mm. property. And at that time, it was a nursing home. But they started growing grapes in 1993, and in 2011, January 2011, the winery was officially founded as a commercial building. Now, along with that, because of all the history of this building, there's supposedly a lot of ghosts. Again, remember, nearly 600 people are buried in the cemetery on site. There's a lot of people that have probably died in the old folks' home or in the hospital. And I'm going to get into some of these ghost stories, but I will say that the hauntings are so well-renowned there, or so famous there, that the sci-fi channel, the Ghost Hunters, filmed an episode there. So there is a well-documented series of supposed hauntings. Not all of them are connected to specific people, which makes some of these ghost stories a little bit difficult to tie to actual events of history, Mm -hmm. which I normally like to do. But I figured I would just run down some of the cool stories that I have collected and, and from interviews with people that have worked there. And awesome. and so we're going to go in that direction. Even though I do typically prefer to say this person lived and died here and now supposedly that ghost is seen there. Some of these are a little bit more amorphous, but roll with it for me because Jesse Limecooler, who is one of the owners of the building, I spoke with him. He's a great guy. And he told me that his first experience, paranormal experience, was actually on the first floor of the winery in the ladies' room. Now, this was after hours, so so, so we don't get the wrong impression about Jesse. And this happened fairly early on after the, the location opened as a winery. He said he was cleaning the sink. He felt a sensation like he was being watched. He turned around, and he saw a little boy about three foot tall, three feet tall, wearing a red shirt, blue knickers, and brown boots. Now, according to Jesse, this kid looked real. He wasn't fuzzy or blurry in a way that you might think of a ghost, but he he said he knew that he wasn't real because he could somehow see the details of the fireplace through him. Mm -hmm. And this little boy wasn't looking at him the whole time. Instead, he was sort of looking over his shoulder at something, which I find even somehow creepier. And he said... The little boy was there for about five to ten seconds and then just sort of faded away. But he remembers a chill shooting up his back and just being shocked at what he saw because he knew it wasn't real. There's another report, this is also coming from Jesse, of an apparition in the library at the winery. And he said he was closing up around 8.30 p.m. He was walking around, doing what you do when you shut down. You know, like working in a store. You lock doors, yeah. you turn off lights. Making oh, certain gosh. that everything is just... Uh, I, I don't know if this if he was doing that, but yes, typically you would do that. But one thing that you probably don't experience in your store is long hallways because... Well, I guess maybe in the, the background stock behind room. the scenes. Yeah, stock room. But anyhow, at the winery in the library, he looks down this long hall that leads to the library. And as he was looking at the doorway, he said he clearly saw a woman walk from light to right to left across the doorway. <laughs> and he did probably what a lot of people would assume that he thought there's a guest still here in the winery. 
So he walks down to the door of the library, and that's the only way to enter the library, since it's at the end of the hallway. And he looks in, and all the windows are screwed shut. There's no other way out of there, yet there's no one in the room. And he remembered reporting getting chills up and down his forearm, and the hairs of his arm were standing straight up. He said he's never experienced that before or since. Okay, now the next story comes from the event coordinator of the Belvoir Winery. And she was working at night, again, closing up for the night, turning off the lights, locking everything up. Goes back to the main bar. And in the bar area, so there's a window you can look out and see across a small courtyard into the library. And she looks over and sees that all the lights are on in the library. Well, she thinks, well, I must have forgotten to turn them all off. Silly me. Goes back, turns them off again. Okay, walks back to the bar. Second time. Again, looks out the window across the courtyard into the library. Lights are on again. Mm. Okay, now that's a little bit weird. Yeah. Goes back to the library. A third time. (laughs) And what's kind of funny is she proceeds to read the riot act, to shout at an empty room. (laughs) She's my kind of woman. And says, look, I got a lot to get done here, which I very much relate to this. I got a lot to get done here. I I need to go home for the night. Yes, girl. Just stop it. Leave it be. Leave all the lights off. Yes. So she turns all the lights off. And as it happens, the lights stayed out for the remainder of the night. Now, the interesting thing is that this kind of mischievous activity is pretty common in the winery because that is the part of the of the business that used to be an orphanage. Mm, the kids. Yeah. So, meanwhile, in the building that used to be the old folks' home, they were setting up for a public investigation. And this is like a paranormal investigation. This mm-hmm. is around dusk. And... As they're setting up, they look down the hallway, and they see a shadow lean out of one of the doors as if it were looking to see what was going on. Now, they're stunned, and and one employee turns to look at the lead investigator, only to realize that the investigator himself had a shocked look on his face because he saw it, too. And I'll tell you what, if you're seeing something yeah. and you're on a ghost hunt and then the lead ghost hunter looks freaked out, yes. it's it doesn't instill you with a lot of confidence. But So totally. what do they think? They thought that maybe there was just a a homeless person in the in this vacant building. So old folks' home is, is vacant. So they head down the hallway to see what was going on. And when we get to the room, the window was locked. No other doors in the win- in the room, and there's a hole in the floor where yeah. the shadow was standing, <gasps> and there was no one else there. And if there had been someone else, they would they would have fallen through this this hole in the floor. And the person that recounted this story is, was stunned and said, <laughs> "The ghost hunter, the lead paranormal investigator, screamed, holy shit!" And that it was kind of amazing to experience like two people experiencing the same thing. Yeah, I just and, goosebumps. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Also, in the first floor ballroom in the winery, now this is back to Jesse. He was he said he was setting up for a wedding on a Saturday night. And he was with his two year old daughter. No one else in the building. He's setting up tables, you know, things you gotta do for an event. And his daughter starts walking towards the exit to the hallway, and he asks her to come back, and she just keeps going. And she takes a left into the hallway. And he shouts, come here. And he clearly heard a female voice say, well, hello, little one. <gasps> oh he rushed into, the, rushed into the hallway only to find his daughter standing down the hallway looking up. He told her to come to him, and she did, smiling the whole way. He said he actually reviewed video of the hallway and saw nothing but Giselle, his daughter, walking down the hallway and there was no one else there. Well, hello, little one. Mmm. Yeah, that one gave me chills, too. That gives me chills. That's so creepy. 
I'll tell you what, anytime you hear not just a word, but a phrase, yes. like an EVP or a disembodied voice, it's especially, especially, especially creepy. I mean, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of crazy stuff. But the stuff that tends to stick with me the most are, well, some some distinct shadow figure reportings that or uh, sightings that I've had, but hearing voices telling you come here i've heard that can we do a mini of all the voices you've heard sure some of them are in my head um <laughs> but yes we can we, yeah we could talk about that um but yeah so something about the voices are especially creepy anyhow there's there's another one that i want to share and this also comes from jesse lime cooler the owner of the belvoir winery and this is from his his other daughter his older daughter and she was in second grade at this time, and she goes, she's in the winery, she goes to one end of the winery, and he's meanwhile in the center part of the building. So she's away from him. About five minutes pass, she comes back into the center area and asks him if he had been down near, near her at the end of the floor. He said no. And then meanwhile, so she proceeds to tell him that while she was down there, she heard a little girl's voice say, Hello, my name is... <gasps> and she couldn't make out the name. She couldn't oh make out God. the name. Oh, my God. I'm guessing not Slim Shady. But... <laughs> so he tells her not to worry about it, which I think is probably what most parents will be like, uh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. But what's interesting is a couple months later, Chip Coffee, who is a psychic medium and a good oh. friend of mine, mm -hmm. and... Someone that I've I've worked alongside Chip on multiple occasions, and I'm really impressed by the work that Chip does. Well, Chip is at the winery for an event, and Jesse, the owner, is taking Chip around the winery, just showing him the building, talking about the history of the place. And they go into that same ballroom that Jesse's older daughter was in a couple of months prior. And as he starts to talk to Chip, Chip says, don't say anything yet. As I walked into this room, I had a small girl approach me, and she said, my name is Susie. I think I'm supposed to tell you that, but I don't know why. And Jesse said that he was absolutely floored because no one except his daughter and his wife knew about that story, and they had never mm -hmm. met Chip before. And so Jesse actually went home and told his daughter the story, and, and she was excited, actually, to find out this girl's name so wow so it's uh i also love a, chip coffee's name yeah well chip coffee's and chip is just a delightful human being as well I've, his I've name been, is delightful his name is delightful he's he and you know i i will say this i will say this on record like i am very skeptical not that i'm disbelieving but i'm very skeptical of a lot of different psychics and mediums i don't i don't say that they're not gifted mm -hmm. but i'm just skeptical but chip is someone that has consistently mm -hmm. i have some chip coffee stories he's consistently just wowed me with things and it, it's funny this is maybe maybe this is should be a little bit off the record but i'll say it anyhow there's times where chips will call me up First off, Chip calls me up, and he always says, Aaron Sagers. He says my full name before he launches into that. whatever I message. love people that are like that. And, but he has oftentimes in the past teased me or cajoled me or, or even, even scolded me for not, not seeking his input or or whatnot on things like why didn't you call and just ask me mm -hmm. about this and i'm like chip i don't know i just don't like to sometimes yeah. i just don't want to tap into some of that and i don't you know because then it gets stuck in my brain but there have been times there have been times and my friendship with chip that he's occasionally come up to me and be like i know you don't normally want to hear this but i have something to tell you and 
he'll lay something on me and it'll be pretty uncanny. Oh my so, God, can I become friends with Chip? I love when people tell me uncanny things. Yeah, I, I, we'll see if we can make that happen. Well, oh my I, God. I will say, Britt, there's a bit of a yes, shameless Aaron. plug in here. <laughs> Do you not like it when I say your name? It's so weird. <laughs> Brett Emmy. Does it feel like I was going to scold you? Do you want me to call you Aaron Sagers now? You can call me whatever you want, but ew! Um, don't make this pervy. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. You made it pervy. <laughs> I didn't say like call me daddy. Ew! <laughs> you know I hate that. Ew! I I don't want to yuck someone's yum, but I could never call a dude daddy. That's. Oh my god, no. The last thing I want to think about in that situation is my father. Have you, have you listened to the podcast Call Her Daddy? No. It's a it's very hip with the kids these days. <laughs> Just like you. And, is it a is it lit? Yeah, it's it's lit, fam. And <laughs> you know it's you know it's uh hip with the kids because I'm saying that. Hip with the <laughs> much like that rock and or roll music. So <laughs> I'm making myself sound way older than I actually am. I, I, yeah, I would you're not say that, that I'm not only am I not that old. I'm pretty. I, I'm. I actually maintain. You're I would young say, for your certain, age. I, I would say I maintain a certain you amount do. of savviness about As someone who's things. dated old men, you are young for your age. I, that's the nicest thing. Thank you. <laughs> I would not say I classify as an old man, but well, old like for me. You the know. well, okay. I like, I'm but date old dudes anyway. I will say that, yeah. Anyhow, call her daddy. It's 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 actually definitely I'm not the target audience for the podcast, <laughs> but it's a it's an interesting podcast. So I would say check it out. But anyhow, that aside, <laughs> I don't even know where we were. At the end of we the were, episode, going. the drinks are finished and we're starting to get loose. I, yeah, I don't know where we, oh yeah, you can, no, you can call me anything you want. That's not pervy to say that. (laughs) But there's, okay, but this is my shameless plug though. So first off, go to the BelvoirWinery.com. There's a lot of historic information there that I couldn't get to because there's a lot of other cool stuff that did happen at the hotel. There was also a, uh, at the, at the winery and inn, there's also a hotel that was built they're called the Winter Hotel, which I like that. You, you're mm-hmm. going going strong when you call your uh, your hotel the Winter Hotel. It was it was based on the name of the of the builder, I guess, or of the owner. But and some other just uh, other cool stories that are connected to it. That said, I think I'm going to be going to the Belvoir Winery when I can travel again. I think cool. I think we'll see how this works out. But watch this space. But Strange Escapes, which is the paranormal tourism uh, event company run by Amy Bruni of Kindred Spirits. Oh, love She's going to host an event at Belvoir Winery. And I think I'm going to go. Oh, my so, God. Do it. Probably be in the summertime. So I've already been doing the research on the on the location. So, so watch cool. this space and keep, a, keep an eye out for it. But... Meanwhile, Thanks so much for inviting me. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was going to make a daddy joke, but I'm not Ew. going to. Ew, what were you going to say? I'll cut it out. I don't, I don't even know. I was just going to. Oh, okay. I just like making you squirm, saying things <laughs> that make you squirm. You wanna, should you, Devin, and me share a room? All right, that's really, that's that makes me squirm. So, <laughs> anyhow... Before we get out of here, how about a what? What do we got in uh, paranormal pop here. culture? What are you digging? So I have two because I haven't talked to you in literally forever. Um, yes, literally forever. Have you seen Truth Seeker on Amazon Prime? Uh, I started to watch a little bit of it, but I'm a big fan of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Yeah, so yeah, I watched I've, it I've, and I was like, Aaron needs to watch this. It feels right up his alley. Yeah, well, I've interviewed those guys multiple times. Have you? It's a good yeah, show. It's I've, fun. Shaun of the Dead is one of my favorite movies. I've never seen it. Well, they're in it. And Edgar White 
E Edgar Wright is the director of that, and yeah. So anyhow, continue. But yeah, I thought Truth. You would like Truth Seeker. It's like this guy who is like a cable guy, but then also has like a paranormal channel. It feels like very fun. Um, yeah, I liked I liked the trailer a lot. Honestly, I'm I'm so behind on things. I just haven't. Well, you've been busy. I, I haven't had time. Well, yeah, I guess I just I just haven't had time to catch up on some stuff, but. Definitely, with that recommendation, I will put it to the top of the list. Yeah. So my pop culture for you is Truth Seeker. My okay. paranormal pop culture for myself is the show Murder on Middle Beach. It's a documentary on HBO. It's a kid who is researching his mother's murder. They don't know who did it. There's, like, a lot of suspects. It is awesome. Yeah. I was – I've not watched that, but I was listening to – I believe a fresh air interview mm. with the guy that it, the documentarian that was telling the story about Madison his mom. Beach. Is that his last that, name? Uh, that sounds about right. Don't quote me on that, but he's very handsome. Yeah. Yeah, he's like a Zac Efron vibe. I don't know if we got into it, but the are you about to dig into Zac Efron? I no, I'm not gonna dig into no, I'm not gonna dig into Zac Efron. I'd love to hear your take on Zac Efron. That's, that's, I have nothing. You know what? I have nothing against Zac Efron. He's great. He is aged he's beautifully, someone, and now he does this whole new down to earth documentary on Netflix about like saving bees, and it's amazing. Yeah, and he seems like a very nice, nice person. So yeah. I have nothing negative to say about. Zach Efron. Zach Efron. Zach no, what Efron. I was going to... Uh, yeah. I don't know why this is suddenly making me very awkward. Uh, Zach Efron just makes me, apparently, have chills. I don't know. Um, no, but uh, what I was going to say is you were talking in one of our Halloween episodes about David Ferrier, who is mm, the hot, dark tourist also. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, also hot. The You know that he was also one of the hosts and producers of the cryptid factor the no, folks I that i is. interviewed it reese darby it was oh love him yeah it was i did a live stream with these guys a couple weeks ago you did a live stream with david farrier and you're only no. telling me about it now no david farrier is no longer on oh, okay. the cryptid Ooh, we factor we're about to get a huge fight in the podcast no but he Helped. He was one of the hosts and producers of the Cryptid Factor with Reese Darby mm. and Leon Buttons Kirkbeck. So, but since then, there's you know he's left the show to do mm. go be famous and do Dark Tours. But anyhow, Got that it. was a side note. So that said, uh, well, yeah, my paranormal pop culture. I guess I should say, <laughs> like I said, I'm kind of behind. But one thing I am researching a lot, which I guess we'll probably be talking about more, but separate from uh, the Nightmarica stuff is I've been researching a lot of, uh, actually already I'm a, I'm a big fan of paranormal Christmas stuff. The, like the goblins, the monsters, the ghost mm. stories that are, that go along with the seasons. And I've written a lot about it in the past. I've talked about it a lot in the past and I have, I, I do some presentations. So I'm just rereading some of these old stories and just kind of getting into that. So I guess you would say overall as a genre, I'm, I'm into a lot of the Christmas ghost stories. But with that, just going down a rabbit hole of a lot of the Charles Dickens Christmas ghost stories. You know, mm -hmm. he did, of course, Christmas Carol, but he did a lot of, a lot of ghost stories set during Christmas time. And still, you know, that, that are not as well known, of course, as the Chris, as a Christmas Carol, but and without Charles Dickens, we wouldn't have sort of a lot of the popularity and traditions that we associate mm -hmm. with Christmas. So, you know, I guess Christ gets some credit, but Dickens, <laughs> Dickens rightfully so gets a lot of credit too. So Dickens, Jesus, and Santa are like the trifecta of, yeah, they are. of Christmas. I would say let's just, you know, to avoid any blaspheme, uh, let's put Jesus at the top of that That trifecta that pyramid but then like santa and then dickens so did you watch a christmas carol on fx last year 
No. Oh, they did like a movie. It was so good. Um, oh, that really good actor. What was his name? He has an interesting face. Played Ebenezer. I never know uh, anyone's name. I but, forget, but one of my favorites is, you know, Patrick Stewart has was notorious for for doing not notorious but he became quite famous for doing a christmas carol and he would do it as a one man play whoa yeah and then eventually he did um some with the rest of a cat with a full cast but yeah he was he he became quite well known for that every year it was guy pierce was, Oh yeah, Guy Pierce. Oh, I do recall that. Yeah, I, I didn't watch it, but I do recall that. But there's so many great. We could do an entire talk about favorite renditions of a Christmas Carol. But I mean, we could. We could do that for a mini soda. We could have my mother on because that's her favorite. Oh my god, we should have we, my mom on as a guest. We have a whole month of uh, Christmassy stuff. So we do. We, we won't. We won't uh, burn the whole Yule log all in this episode. So. <laughs> So yeah, I've just been going down a rabbit hole of reading Charles Dickens stories and a lot of the Christmas stories, such as the Haunted uh, Haunted Signal, I believe, or Signal Man, and Christmas Goblins. There's a lot of good ones out there. It's good. So before we wrap up, final note, hey, uh, we don't really talk about this a whole lot, but if you could leave a review on mm-hmm. Apple Podcasts, that does a lot for us, it boosts our visibility i mean a good review would be preferable lots of stars but But even like a four star is fine yeah it's but you know five is better but it boosts our visibility and helps us get out there and additionally yeah real quick manscaped.com code nightmarica get 20 percent off free shipping off your order don't don't you know it's the right right tools for the job don't nick your nugs and and get it so the men in your life don't nick their, nick their respective nugs. nugs. Or so no nugs are nicked anywhere. <laughs> what a happier world. What a Christmas wish that would be. A world without nicked nugs. I think a, a man can dream and a man can get manscaped. Just saying. Okay. Shall we get out of here? Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please consider giving us a review on Apple Podcasts, following us on social media, and sharing the show with your friends. And if you're able, we appreciate your support on patreon.com slash nightmarica so we can keep bringing you more spooky stories. And if you'd like to share your own paranormal stories or seek paranormal advice for entertainment purposes only, email us at nightmericashow at gmail.com.